how do you feel as someone who was the, the records stay, right? The documented thing stays what it is. You continue moving on. How do you feel about that being there and documented? Like, is that cool and good or is that weird and awkward? I mean, I guess it just, you know, it is what it is. I, uh, um, yeah, there's a bunch of it that I is kind of embarrassing for sure. But like, I think that it's also like, it, I got like nothing to hide, you know, like when like, you find out like someone was like in the, you know, Mickey Mouse club and then they like have to like change their image and be like, now I'm like down and dirty, edgy, you know, it's like my shit, you can just find it all. You can like watch like every progression is it's right there. So in that sense, I'm kind of free of having to like hide anything or like reinvent myself or whatever, you know. Yeah, there's some there's some freedom and beauty and just having that stuff out there. I guess you're not in control of how someone decides to interpret it or whatever. Like I listened to your interview on the, the washed up emo thing, all about emo and everything. And like, you can count me among the people I think. Cause I was growing up with and attaching to that same kind of folk music you were talking about while also mm. like treading into like discovering the, the, the punk bands I was seeing with my friends and everything that when I heard bright eyes, I was simultaneously learning about the word emo at that time. And was just I was like I, I was like forcefully rejecting like what the fuck are you talking about like all like almost all music is emotional in some way like what are we talking about this is this is this no, is I, fa- I found it baffling too like we we I mean I remember actually specifically like the first time Command Arena is like my high school band we were we were actually out here on tour. And yeah, I was probably like 16, so I was like 1996, and like, we played somewhere, I think we played like Spaceland or whatever club, and then this like girl after the show was like, you should play it, you should have played at the, whatever the other club was, because like, that's where all the emo bands play, and I was like, emo? Like, and then I, you know, figured out like... Yeah, but I'm like, yeah, emotional... Isn't emotion part of music? I mean, unless you're, like, Debo or something, it's, like, who, like, specifically tries to take it out of their music, you know? Yeah. I feel like it's kind of, like, an uh, essential part of music, in my mind. What is a love song? What is, like, all... Like, the tropes we say about country songs? Like, it's broken hearts. It's, like... Yeah. Wow. But it, but it's because, I mean, emo is its own very real other thing. Like, there's a genre and a history and there's a thing there. You guys covered that well in that conversation. But it was, like, in the moment, as a person who didn't know, I just remember, like, re- just really rejecting it. And uh, what's come up a lot is, like, my high school friend Ashley burned me a few CDs, like, Get Up Kids CDs, and one of them was Fevers and Mirrors. And I can remember being one of the people, one of the guests on this podcast talked about, like, the long intro tracks as, like, shaking off the squares and I wasn't looking to like this music. I'd never heard of bright eyes and I didn't like the, the word emo or whatever. I was like on principle, it seemed weird to me. And I remember hearing the intro track and like being like, nah, I'm, I'm cool. And it like sat in my car for like three or four months until I eventually got past that into like songs two, three, four, five. I was like, this is just good. This is just really cool songwriting. This is just good. Mm-hmm. 